Thank you for uh, being a part of the conversation today. You're joining us for a compare and contrast session with two global leaders setting the pace in the innovation market. We're gonna look at crowdsourcing versus tech scouting, which one's better? When would you use one over the other? When would you use them together or sequentially? Uh, so I'm Gina Sparrow. I work for HeroX as a strategic project manager. I'm so happy to be here with you both. I'm gonna hand this over uh, to Tim to get us started with some introductions. Uh, enjoy the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Gina. And uh, uh, on behalf of Yet2, uh, we are very honored to be here uh, and to be your guests. Uh, uh, and uh, also very excited about uh, coming partnership uh, with HeroX. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm Tim Bernstein. Uh, I am CEO of Yet2. Uh, I'm based out of Boston here uh, with the majority of our team at our headquarters. Um, I've been with the company uh, almost 21 years now. Uh, my background, I have an MBA and a master's in technology commercial, commercialization. Uh, and these days I spend a lot of my time thinking about how do large companies harness open innovation, not just to get pretty reports and interesting opportunities, but how do they move to impact with that flow of external, uh, external uh, in, in, input. Uh, and so with that, I will hand it over to Christian uh, to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, thanks, Tim, um, and hello. Uh, my name is Christian Cotaccini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of HeroX, and I've uh, been a long-time entrepreneur, and uh, my career is focused on really disruptive innovation and bringing that to market, and commercializing it, and making a business around it. And I'm fascinated by the process of innovation, uh, the, the, especially the human side. So I've become a student of understanding um, how to um, plan for innovation, optimize for innovation, what innovation looks like um, when it's in progress uh, versus what it looks like in hindsight. And uh, I know that I've spent some time with Tim and, and we have some you know, really um, parallel and interesting um, work that we're doing in both our companies. So I'm excited to explore that. Excellent. Uh, and uh, it's uh, maybe that should have been our debate today instead, Christian, about uh, disruptive versus incremental innovation, which is better and why do large companies struggle? Because uh, mm -hmm. we, we also take a human-centered approach to that same exact question, uh, but focused more on microeconomics and game theory and what are the incentives that want to be innovator space inside these large companies? Uh, mm -hmm. Why does that make why does it make life, innovation life hard for them? Uh, but maybe that's a maybe that's the next webinar. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, good. And I see uh, questions starting to flow in already. Uh, Gina is uh, going to be tracking those, and uh, she'll uh, interject. And certainly, uh, Christian and I uh, more than intend uh, to save a chunk of time uh, after our uh, speeches here uh, to to really engage in more of a dialogue around these questions. So. So please keep them flowing, that, uh, that's terrific. Uh, so yet to just a brief background on us, and then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, crowdsourcing versus, uh, versus uh, proactive technology scouting uh, from yet two's perspective, uh, before I turn things over to Christian. Uh, so yet two, we've been around for 20 years. Uh, we are experts uh, at harnessing open innovation to ignite corporate innovation. And we wanna get all the way through to impact with you. How do we get to deals? And how do we get you moving uh, products to market, new innovations into your processes, uh, greater sustainability rolling out to the world? How do we get corporations to impact uh, out of these activities? Uh, so we uh, I do a, a little bit of uh, scouting. We also can do some work around uh, business development, even ventures, and and uh, interacting with startup companies, and even advising. Uh, we have a, a strong global network. Uh, we work very hard on our methodologies, in particular, not just for the scouting, but for interacting with and advising and guiding uh, our our clients, large companies, to be able to take better advantage and move through to deals and impact uh, with with that flow of opportunity. So yeah, too, I mentioned we have that large global network. Uh, we uh, also have uh, a, a strong and growing uh, team of experts uh, and uh, that methodology around becoming a trusted partner of virtual seed at our client's table. Uh, so then uh, if you roll into our, our services, 
Uh, I'm not going to spend much time at all on this today. Uh, if you're interested, happy to follow up with you later. You can see in the leftmost column there that we actually have four different flavors of proactive scouting that uh, we have uh, innovated and introduced over the last few years. We run open innovation uh, portal platforms uh, now for about a dozen clients. Uh, we do a little bit of out licensing work and we do some very interesting patent analysis uh, for some of our clients as well. All of that really important tool sets feeding into that open innovation impact. Uh, so then uh, if you roll toward the next slide, uh, just to show very briefly here, uh, most of our clients remain uh, anonymous and we keep their identities very carefully uh, uh, veiled uh, because a lot of the work we're doing for them is very strategic and they really don't want their competitors to know where they're headed next. But a few of our clients also use us publicly in their names. And so you can see a, a flavoring of our cross industry and cross geography base. Uh, as well, a couple of testimonials there. Uh, I don't want to spend long on this again today, but uh, our uh, proactive scouting services, our intent is to both scour the earth uh, and use all of uh, yet to use full channels globally to be able to bring you all of the most relevant solutions out there in the world that can solve a problem or a challenge. Uh, but we also, in the process, want to arm you uh, to be able to make decisions uh, very efficiently and move ahead toward, uh, toward that impact uh, and toward those goals. Uh, so we're showing here one of our recent projects where we built a, a solution scape of the 35 most promising solutions we were able to find out there in the world. And we were able to categorize them and flag them for interest. Uh, and actually you can see three different dimensions of categorization on, on this 2D page here. Uh, so we were pretty excited about that. What, what, what can, can you give an example of like the type of categorization you talk about, you work on here? Yep. So in this case, we categorize, as I said, in three different dimensions. The first dimension was what technology domain uh, does the solution come from? So in this case, we're talking about cold chain uh, uh, transport of uh, food and pharmaceuticals where if you drop uh, any warmer than minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you put minus 18 Fahrenheit, uh, you, you put uh, that food or that pharmaceutical at risk. Uh, and so uh, today, uh, what, what companies do in this cold chain is uh, he heavy, heavy insulation, uh, significant power and energy uh, in order to keep uh, that, that cold of a, of a temperature. Uh, we went out looking for technologies where you could, with a much smaller environmental footprint, uh, actually more accurately uh, protect, uh, protect those, those temperature variations. Uh, so it, this, the categories and the subcategories that we're showing there were different types of materials, uh, devices, uh, even a couple of service and new business model innovations. So at the top horizontal level there, it was generally different types of technologies. Uh, then along the vertical, we looked at uh, reusable versus compostable versus recyclable uh, technology approaches. Uh, and then the third dimension was around uh, level of interest for our client, uh, where uh, yellow is really good uh, and white is not quite so interesting. So. The subject of the day, crowdsourcing versus proactive scouting. Uh, we really like proactive scouting, uh, but dirty little secret, we also like crowdsourcing. Uh, and we think there's a time and a place for both. Uh, we also think that there are uh, advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, and so we're describing a little bit of that here on this next slide. Uh, so you can see that with open innovation and proactive technology scouting, uh, we can anonymously seek external R&D technologies, new startup companies, uh, innovations coming out of the large corporates they aren't talking about yet. Uh, all of that uh, without revealing our clients' identity so they don't give away competitive intelligence to the world until they're really ready to do so. Technology proactive scouting does have uh, some, some issues, some challenges that go along with it. Uh, we talk in microeconomic terms about knowledge asymmetries. Uh, we also talk about uh, the, the need for uh, negotiation in order to reach a deal 
uh, with those most promising solution providers. And sometimes that goes well and sometimes it doesn't go so well. Uh, so uh, we've gotten better and better over time at advising our clients on how to get through those neg negotiations successfully, how to match uh, a large company pace with a startup pace. So we've become pretty expert uh, in, in those types of dynamics, but there are certainly some concerns about the proactive scouting. Similarly with the crowdsourcing, uh, consumer goods ideation, uh, ideas about new molecules. Uh, Christian's gonna talk a lot about uh, where you use crowdsourcing to great effect. We've definitely seen some issues with crowdsourcing as well. Uh, IP can be tricky. Uh, what if they own something really powerful and they don't want to share it, but they do want to raise their hand and say well, they should be considered? Uh, that, that sometimes lends itself better to a, a proactive scouting approach. Uh, significant management effort required, especially around keeping your crowds happy. Uh, and we're, we're going to be very curious to hear you talk a little bit about that, Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the crowd challenges are often in, in the client's name, which could see competitive response. Uh, however, there are times and places where uh, the, the, the crowd can be very powerful. So uh, on the next slide, we describe just a little bit of those eight global channels that yet two uses to go out and do our proactive scouting. Uh, our, our response, our alternative to the crowd, if you will, uh, and a lot of our channels are direct in nature where we've been building up those contacts day by day over the last 20 years. And some of our channels are a little bit more crowd-like uh, in, in a broadcast sense of the term. Uh, and uh, we've uh, actually greatly expanded our online social media presence in those uh, inventor uh, solution provider communities uh, over the last couple of years as well. So, uh, you know, we, we like to talk uh, kind of starkly for purposes of the of the webinar today and, and for sport and fencing and all that good stuff. But in reality, uh, you know, we've blurred a little bit toward crowdsourcing ourselves over time. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so then uh, I think my punchline for the day, uh, we'll see where Christian lands on this. Uh, we see lots of opportunity uh, for the combination of a proactive uh, scouting effort plus a crowd uh, can often yield much greater benefit than either tool by itself. And um, we've done a bunch of work along these lines. Uh, we're showing in the upper right on this slide, uh, a project that we've just recently worked on, uh, which we call Saving the Whales, because uh, that's what the project was. Uh, how do you pull those nasty lines and nets that run from the surface down to, uh, uh, down to traps and cages on the ocean floor? Uh, those, uh, those traps and those nets uh, are the single biggest source of, uh, of uh, whale death other than uh, illegal hunting. Uh, and if you could simply be able to locate the traps on the floor without those tracking nets, uh, you'd save a, a bunch of whales in a big hurry. Uh, and we went out and did proactive scouting to identify the types of technologies, to identify specific solution providers who absolutely need to be a part of, of solving this problem. Uh, and then we turned this uh, set of insight. Uh, we also reframed a couple of very specific parts of the problem uh, that you can isolate and solve uh, in a much more, we think of a much more successful and much quicker way. And uh, our client, uh, which is the uh, US government, uh, will be uh, translating that into prize challenges shortly uh, that we think are gonna be much, spark, much smarter, much uh, more focused, much more likely to yield successful solutions at the back end because of that proactive scouting that really helped them set the strategy well for that. So that's a nice example where we see uh, scouting first leads into a smarter challenge. Uh, we've seen a bunch of cases where uh, challenge first then it arms us to do much smarter scouting later on. Uh, so our punchline is actually, uh, if it's important enough, go do both. Yeah, that's great. And I, I love that use case example because, um, you know, I, I, I sail and uh, it's amazing how much crap is in the water. Let's, um, let's kind of pin down what tech, what we mean by tech scouting, what we mean by crowdsourcing in, in kind of a sp more specific ways. So um, do you want, uh, let me start with um, to kind of pinning down, you know, crowdsourcing. And we're specifically t talking about, in fact, let me, I've got a little slide here. Um, 
we're specifically talking about open innovation, uh, like crowdsourcing knowledge work. Um, and um, you know, crowdsourcing is an open call, um, you know, on on the internet, um, um, where you basically pose a challenge, a, a, a goal, you provide an incentive, um, you provide rules and a timeline and guidelines. And, and, um, and so it's basically like a, a wanted dead or alive poster uh, for the modern era. Tim, why don't you give a kind of a quick version of what uh, crowdsourcing is? Yep. Or so, tech scouting, sorry. So tech scouting, proactive scouting, uh, similar goal in mind. How do we find the best solutions out there in the world uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to solve a, a technical challenge. However, uh, as opposed to the crowd, uh, with, with proactive scouting, uh, they're not really rules. It's mm -hmm. fairly open-ended how we engage with the solution providers. And then it's a negotiation between that solution provider and, the, and our client, the, the, the searching company. Uh, that's an open negotiation to determine what's a form of deal that works for both sides. Uh, you know, often a license or joint research, uh, sometimes uh, outright acquisition if the fit is really strong enough, uh, but a little bit more open-ended than those rules that you set in place uh, and that prize you offer at the end of a, of, of a crowd challenge. Uh, I think the other big difference, uh, we use those eight channels that you're showing right there uh, to go out and we identify who we think are the solution providers. Right. We, uh, and a couple hundred thousand of our best friends out in the, in the Yeti network. Uh, so we're not waiting for, for the solution providers to decide whether they're relevant or not and whether they should reply or respond or submit. Uh, we're going to go call you. Uh, so we're going to do a bunch of searching, scour the earth, uh, identify maybe a hundred uh, small companies, large companies, universities, research labs, contract manufacturers, uh, experts in the space. Uh, we're going to identify 100 or 200 of those. Then we're going to go call the 30 or 40 we think look most promising and work with our client to filter down to the two or the five where we'll move into collecting samples. Uh, we'll move into evaluations and due diligence and confidentiality agreements. And then ultimately uh, assist our client in moving into a deal uh, with the one or two top solution providers who solve their problem. Uh, so uh, a little bit more hands-on, uh, much more uh, proactive from us out to the solution providers, uh, rather than letting the, the, the submitters decide if they want to participate or not. That makes a lot of sense. So if, if, I, if I can um, mix my metaphors then, so it's kind of like, you know, crowdsourcing is kind of like, um, you know, the FBI, FBI's most wanted list, right, where they, you know, they kind of you know, share who they wa want, often with a, a bounty attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hey, if anybody helps us find this person, whereas tech scouting is kind of like an FBI task force, right? Mm -hmm. A group of investigators who are going to proactively go and find um, their, um, um, their, their, their perpetrator. Yep. Um, makes sense, right? Yeah, very good. Yeah. I think another big difference is, um, the um like the well let me just jump over here actually da, da, da. okay so another big difference i think is is the the problem domain versus solution domain um focus right so if you think about it and you know you can you can look at any um you know innovation or any tech acquisition as having both a problem domain and a solution domain right so for example you know if we're talking about let's say you know, Starbucks um, wanting uh, compostable, you know, um, cups and lids and straws for their stores. You know, the problem domain is the um, impact of plastic and, and non-compostable products and the waste that's created, that's the problem domain. The solution domain um, is about, for example, you know, the use of, um, you know, corn-based plasticizers or mm -hmm. whatever, right? Dis um, dissolvable yeah. papers, PVOHs. Yeah. yeah, and so um, crowdsourcing is um, works best when you um, interface um, on the problem domain, meaning you share the problem mm -hmm. um, and you define um, 
you, you define how you measure the problem and, and, and measure the breakthrough that you're looking for, like measure the solution. How do we test the solution? That becomes your bounty uh, criteria, right? Then you incentivize it. And then you provide guidelines like, you know, um, we want to use things that are sustainable or they have to fit within a certain unit cost or they can't involve hazardous materials or so you can provide a, a set of rules that that add additional constraints um, to the solution domain right like we're willing to solve the, this problem but only with these constraints so the, that's kind of the crowdsourcing approach the tech scouting approach sounds like it's more in this in the solution domain when mm -hmm. um, let's say a company is clear how they want to solve a problem in, in broad strokes, meaning we're looking for, you know, biodegradable plastics or biodegradable materials. Like there's probably other ways to solve this, like reusable cups, you know, whatever, right. To use the Starbucks analogy, but mm -hmm. we're looking for this type solution. And that's when text coding works best. Is that a, an accurate representation or how would you, how yeah, I would have said that that the client is probably in this in a pretty similar space in both cases, much more on the the, the problem domain side of the world. Um, and and in fact, when clients come to us with presumptions or or ideas or or locked thinking about solution spaces, that makes us very nervous uh, because often they're thinking in terms of their geography and their technology capabilities. And we might see a great solution to their problem in an adjacent industry and an adjacent geography. Uh, and we'd rather not that they, they not constrain that solution set prematurely. Mm -hmm. uh, but we yet too, and the experts we bring to work on these projects and those broadcast networks that I talked about a, a couple minutes ago, uh, we all end up thinking very heavily in solution domains. Uh, so those categories that we were showing on the, on the cold chain, uh, absolutely, that's where we spend the bulk of our time. Once we're comfortable that we've thought about what are the right solution domains, uh, then we go knock them off one by one. Uh, who are the best players in each? How do they compare to each other? Which approach is most likely to, to be able to solve all those constraints you described a couple minutes ago? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's apt uh, that we spend a lot of our time uh, on the solution domain side of the world. Gotcha. Yeah. So, but it sounds like um, you guys will help the client, you know, um, kind of uh, calibrate their focus on um, promising um, solution avenues, right? Like, in, in fact, we prefer that they not have thought too much about that before they come to us. Yeah. Yeah. I find that I, I think it's human nature. Whenever, whenever we're talking about a problem, people, it's just human nature to jump into solving it, right? Like it's the way we were wired. So it's, we, we when we talk to clients and, and uh, organizations interested in crowdsourcing, they almost always have a vision for what they, they're looking for. That's, that's um, that creates a box. Do you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it creates an inside the box thinking, right? Yeah, um, I know. And, I, I can give you an example uh, very briefly here, if you like. Uh, you yeah, had sure. a client uh, not that long ago, uh, recently, come to us, uh, they make uh, um, prepared ice cream, like ice cream sandwiches or ice cream cones. Uh, and uh, the wrappers uh, historically have been highly uh, unenvironmental. Uh, you, you can't recycle those wrappers. When you try to recycle them, they screw up the recycle. There's aluminum in there. Then there's often another kind of metal, uh, metalization to them. And then you have the paper inside that. So when you start to pull the aluminum out and just go as pure paper, the lipids, the fats from the ice cream mm -hmm. uh, leach into the paper. And then when you go on shelf to go buy your ice cream, you see this paper that looks like it's like, you know, insipid or like filled with all this like waste stuff. And you're like, I'm not buying that. So when they tried to go to environmental, uh, they, they lost the battle on shelf and they came to us and they said, we need a coating. So inside the box, we need a coating that will protect the rest of the paper wrapper from the fat in the ice cream. Right. Uh, and we went at that for a little while. Uh, pretty much any coating that you could dream of that's, that's safe enough to be able to, to, to lay right next to food like ice cream, it's going to crack somewhere at some point in uh, the manufacturing or the distribution chains or, or in the freezer uh, you know, at, the, at the supermarket. Uh, and once it cracks, 
the lipids uh, seep through the crack, leach into the paper, and you have that same nasty looking uh, presentation at shelf. We finally figured out about a third of the way into the project, what if we switch this around? What if we put the, the anti-leaching function, what if we embed that into the paper itself? Forget about mm -hmm. a coating and mm -hmm. imbue that whole layer of the paper uh, with this anti-leaching capability. In effect, you encapsulate uh, the fats right where they start to enter the paper in the first place at a micro level so that you don't see it at shelf. All of a sudden you're winning the shelf again. You can withstand any of those cracks, any of the issues around distribution and transportation. Uh, and that, that, uh, that solution is now on shelf uh, out commercial. Uh, I'm continuing down that approach of trying to find a coating. Uh, and it took a while for us to convince our client that imbuing the full, uh, the, the, the full layer of the paper was actually a, a legitimate technical approach. Uh, they they would they would still be inside that box. Uh, so right. yeah, the, the, the less they lock themselves into boxes in the solution domain uh, up front, the happier we are. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to digress, but um, having spent a fair amount of time in kind of the you know engineering related uh, conversations and and projects, um, uh, I've developed a much higher respect for engineers and mm -hmm. the, the challenges you know the, when we when we use end products it, everything seems so simple you know like mm -hmm. it's easy, and and then when you get into like the actual properties of materials you realize it's it's not at all simple like mm -hmm. it's amazing some of the challenges you know atoms just don't like to stay where you put them yeah you know especially when liquids are involved and stuff and you, you think it's sim as simple as you just need something that's, you know, waterproof or whatever, but there's like, it turns out that there's hardly anything that's actually truly, you know, um, impervious of anything, you know, but yep. things are always moving around. The materials science is super challenging. And it, the fact that we even are able to build these products that work so well, you know, we, like a lithium battery, you know, with, with its challenges, you know, and they work, um, it's pretty incredible. Like we're, we're pretty crafty people. There is a, there is good news in there as well, Christian. Uh, it's a job security for uh, Hero X and Yet Two as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's really interesting, and and um, you know there's, because there's such an acceleration in in technology, and and companies uh, are you know facing um, you know entering new products, creating Internet of Things applications, and all sorts of you know change in marketplaces. Um, there's a, a lot of need for um, for innovation and technology, and, and that's really great. Um, no, that's that's good. The now um, another area you you mentioned about this is IP transfer is stuff. Now, so why don't you drill down a little bit about like okay, so you find a solution. How does just at at, at broad brush high level, right? How on the text cutting side do you then um, help the client from a okay, we have found a solution now. How do we um, you know, handle the IP or licensing part of it. Right. Um, so uh, let's take another example. Um, uh, we're looking for uh, um, consumer insights firms uh, that are black or minority owned uh, or and or have great access into uh, black consumer communities. Uh, and so um, that, that's not something you can go Google for. Uh, there's not, uh, you know, a, a website online somewhere that has a list of those. Uh, so we go out to our eight networks, uh, scour the earth, uh, talk to a bunch of experts who are in our network, identify a bunch of these types of companies. Uh, then we'll go out and interview each of them. Uh, in fact, we did one of those interviews this morning and we have another one lined up tomorrow. Uh, and in collaboration with our client, will then identify a top three or four criteria uh, our client is seeking in order to differentiate which of these firms look like the best uh, solution, the, the best partner for us going forward. Uh, and it would be criteria like, how big is your audience of, of black consumers? Uh, you know, how well uh, diversified are you across male, female, and different age vectors? Uh, can you talk about hair? Can you talk about skin? Can you talk about cleansing? Uh, how rigorous is your process? How solid are your analytics people uh, around being able to, to, to run the numbers well? 
uh, whatever that set of criteria is, uh, a lot of our searches, uh, a key criterion would be how comprehensive is the IP that you filed? Uh, did you file it globally? Do we believe it really could preclude competitors from following? Another big criterion is stage of development. Uh, everybody wants their solution now. So are you TRL seven or eight or nine where we can go to market quickly? Or are you TRL three where we're gonna have to spend a bunch of money at high risk? and take a lot of time. Uh, so, so those criteria we work out with our client, we then go out and ask all of the top 10 or top 12 or top 15 solution providers, what are your answers to those key three or five questions? And then we'll run a straight prioritization and be able to say company C or company number three out of the eight that, that we've interviewed in detail, they're by far the best likely partner for you because they fit this criterion, they fit that criterion. Uh, so it's um, a little bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat with those top solution providers based on the decision-making criteria that our client's going to employ uh, to solve that problem. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, now, you, you uh, used a, a term. I think this is a really important term to discuss, um, TRL, and we, we use the same uh, methodology. So let's talk about that and, and how that's uh, applicable, um, how it's why it's important for a client to understand it, how it's applicable to both tech scouting, and I'll talk about uh, how it, it's applicable to crowdsourcing. Yeah, so TRL, technology readiness level, I think it was originally invented by DARPA or NASA or both or, um, you know, maybe 40 years ago. It's just a common language to be able to describe how close to ready for commercial uh, is a technology, uh, where TRL1 is a, is a raw idea and TRL9 is you've been commercialized somewhere, uh, somewhere relevant or, or interesting. Uh, our clients generally are looking for anything TRL three or four or five plus. Uh, if you're TRL nine and you're over 10 or $20 million of success in the marketplace, our client probably already knows about you. So we don't add much value there. So you can see where get to's window is. When clients come to us and say, we want a whole bunch of really creative TRL one and TRL two ideas, uh, we'll often send them to HeroX. Uh, because uh, the, the crowd is a much more efficient way to come up with, with raw, creative new ideas uh, than our proactive, uh, proactive scouting networks. Uh, but, but happy, Christian, to have you chime in on that as well. I'm not sure what, where it was invented, but it, it is heavily used by NASA, um, and it, it, it became a really critical component um, all the way back to the um, Apollo and, and Mercury programs. Uh, just an understanding that... Um, you know, they, they, they had to do things that humans have never done before, you know, create capabilities, um, you know, that hit um, you know, levels of capability that weren't um, possible and in environments that just you know, things weren't designed for. Um, and so they needed to have a, a method of um, managing risk and, and understanding the level of testing and validation that was required for things. So. Um, you know, it's, it's easy it, at the business level, you know, it's a common error to, you know, read an article about, a, you know, technology or something that's maybe TRL one, two or three, and then, you know, plan on embedding it in your product, for example, and um, not understand the steps that's required, um, you know, to, to be able to commercialize and, um, and, and use technologies at an industrial scale. And, uh, when these things are, are skip the steps, um, you often see that in the form of failed products, right? Um, that don't perform as, as they, they are expected. And, uh, and also just spiraling costs um, and um, um, poor quality, um, poor reliability, uh, those other things. So um, we always try to map our, our clients' um, goals from a crowdsourcing standpoint to understand the TRL level that we're targeting. And, and crowdsourcing tends to be on the lower end of the scale. And I think tech scouting tends to be in the middle of the scale. Would that be accurate? Very much so. Yeah. And in fact, it's a great way to, um, to even determine whether uh, an organization should um, um, look at tech scouting or look at crowdsourcing. You know, if you're really looking for the, the, the those raw ideas, you know, the, the PhD um, 
student that you know, spent two years working on a specific, you know, um, plastic coating for battery terminals. You know, you're not going to find that um, um, very easily because that's going to be down in you know TRL two, for example. Okay. You know, it's a science paper almost, right? Um, and so, um, so you know that the, you can you can source a lot of the the kind of more fundamental um, technology breakthroughs and ideas. And in fact, in crowdsourcing, you you um, you know it's not even about sourcing it. You can actually have people do it for you in real time, right? That's a, a, a fundamental difference um, from what we've talked about before. So and, that's a, that's an important concept. I think that uh, organizations can use the the TRL scale um, to help manage their own innovation approaches and and avoid um, you know cr crazy technology that's that's too risky to work. Um, if you're trying to you know, um, find technology to solve, um, you know, um, a manufacturing problem that's in the hundreds of thousands of units a year manufactured. Um, the the requirements for for readiness of a solution at that scale, you know, that needs to be implemented in factories, et cetera, is very different than, let's say, um, you know, building a prototype. And the one other thing I'd add, Christian, we do do some work uh, even at TRL nine. Uh, we have one client. Oh, I actually can talk about this a little bit. Uh, Mondelez's new Snack Futures Group is trying to revolutionize uh, how snacks are made, what their health profile looks like, uh, what their life cycle analysis and and their their circular economy impacts on the environment are. Uh, and we're hosting. Uh, we're honored to be able to host uh, their open innovation portal, uh, which is a little bit of a mix of a crowd plus proactive, uh, all in, in one platform there. Uh, and they are primarily interested in snacks that are already commercial, uh, just not at much scale yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, are you in, in 10 local supermarkets? Uh, they'd be extremely excited about that. They're just now starting to branch into early TRL as well. Uh, with a, a new innovation effort they call CoLab uh, that'll take us more toward the hero X part of the spectrum. Uh, but that, that's one search we're doing right now uh, for, for already commercial products. Uh, another one, we have a, a toothpaste manufacturer uh, who's looking for a contract manufacturer uh, to help them produce uh, excess uh, oversupply of the product. Uh, and they are looking very much for uh, a manufacturing company that's already been up and running that is at scale uh, that has great uh, quality uh, assurance uh, packaging capabilities so that's another example of a trl9 uh, type of search we do get into those ones as well yeah that makes a lot of sense well, that's great um uh what i thought i'd do is, is i'd like to talk about a couple of uh exact case study examples uh, and these are i picked some um, that are, I think, are are good use cases for um, a crowdsourcing approach versus a tech scouting approach. But but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So let's start with uh, let's start with this one. Right. So this is uh, so so let me just give the quick overview of this. Um, so this was uh, a, a a gold uh, mining company. Uh, um, they're called uh, they're the ones that search for search for gold. I forget what they're called. They're not the, like the refiners are the ones that like, you know, actually process the ore into gold. They're the prospectors, I guess. Um, and um, they had um, purchased um, mining rights to a, a large uh, um, region um, and um, had a ton of geographical data that had been um, produced by the previous owner. And a lot of it was in a, in a rough state, um, spanned 20, 20 plus years. 1800 core samples gigabytes i think it was i think it, the data set added up six terabytes which is a lot of data That's and they data. wanted to six terabytes yeah hmm. yeah um and so think about even trying to download it you know what i mean like it's crazy but um um they wanted to, the, the 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 challenge we ran for them they wanted people to find the gold so the, the idea was analyze the six terabytes of data um, and give us your analysis of where, like how much gold is here, where is it, you know, basically, you know, find the gold. So um, they received over 100 submissions, uh, organizations that, you know, 
process their the data and, and look for gold. And, and so I, I see this as an example of where crowdsourcing fits better. Obviously, this is a, at a larger scale from a budget standpoint than, than tech scouting would typically be. But um, uh, just the, the problem domain they were looking at, um, you know, have a lot of data, it's in a mess, uh, we need to move fast. Um, there's so much technology capabilities that we don't even know where to begin. So let's just put it out as a crowdsourcing challenge and see what happens. And it ended up being a, a really great success. Mm. That's a, that's a, that's a very cool example. Yeah. Yeah. Another example on the crowdsourcing side is uh, this one, which we did a few years ago. Um, and this is a good example of, um, you know, uh, for crowdsourcing, the, the ability, um, you know, the, the what interesting thing about crowdsourcing is, is it's a public effort, right? Now you, you can um, do crowdsourcing um, confidentially by, by um, leaving the, 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 the company's, the sponsor's name out of it and mm -hmm. using uh, a different brand. We, we have partners uh, often like consulting companies who will run crowdsourcing projects for a, a secret client just to keep their identity out of it um, because they don't want their competitors to know that they're interested in a certain problem or, or domain. Um, but it, it, it can also be used, um, in, you can use the public nature of crowdsourcing, the fact that it's an open call and you're broadcasting it out, you can use it for your advantage. In this case, um, this was a, a challenge around, you know, feeding into a, a, a larger uh, contest that was feeding into a conference um, um, about finding um, entrepreneurs under 30 um, with uh, really cool technologies and they actually had investors who invested. So the, the million dollars they gave away was actually um, in million dollars of investment into mm. these early stage companies. Um, yeah. And um, this, they had over 2,700 submissions. Um, wow. on this. So, so that's kind of like when you're looking at kind of this like type scale, you know, um, crowdsourcing, mm -hmm scales really well right like if you're if you're looking for vol high volume as the input like a really broad funnel i think that's where crowdsourcing works well if yeah. if you're looking for a more precision right looking for the best we need to see the best i want to see the best three or the best five um in this that's where text scouting shines am i right i think that's an excellent uh, compare and contrast we, yeah. uh, I don't think there's anything we can do where we could handle 2,700 uh, uh, potential solutions. Yeah, and you know, you when you do that, you have to be broad, like that that project we did. You know, the, you have to provide a, a like a, a broad um, a criteria that will fit well um, at that scale. Whereas with I think tech scouting to be very precise and specific. I, how do you filter 2,700 uh, candidate submissions? How do you get down to the the 10 winners? Oh yeah, well that's a whole other topic. But um, the often, well that one in in fact um, they were, you know, pretty familiar with and prepared for that volume. Mm -hmm. um, we um, we've had other projects where um, you know we weren't expecting a large submission rate and we get like ten or twenty times what we expected. And that's when it really becomes challenging. So mm -hmm. we use a combination of um, you know um, um, machine like algorithmic um, scoring, like pre-scoring of submissions um, to um, identify the most likely, um, the most promising ones. Um, and, then a, and then human review, um, and then a full, the full like scoring and assessment of, of them. So we, we create a multi-phase thing that's technology assisted. Um, but when, um, when you have large submission rates, especially in a, in, in a complicated or, or technically challenging uh, approach, um, you, you need to, it, it can become quite labor intensive and you need to create a, a large set of, of uh, judges who are participating in that. I think the largest set we've had is 180 judges. Um, <laughs> That's on our platform. excellent. Yeah. And, and our That's platform excellent. handles all the workflow for that. But, but just uh, two quick shout outs on it though. Crowd voting also works well, where mm -hmm. you, 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 you share the submissions um, and let the crowd um, of score and evaluate them. So that's you know, crowd voting. And then also um, using a um, uh, like a, a, a contest, like a, a finalist round contest model. So for mm -hmm. example, I don't think I have the slide here, but we did a, an a AI project for Lockheed Martin uh, for AI piloting a drone. 
So um, they received lots of submissions. Well, instead what they did was they, they, they took the top six, I think, and let them race the drones against each other, <laughs> right? Um, so that kind of sorts it out. You know what I mean? Like, the, yeah. and in fact, keep... in order to winnow it down to the finalists, we actually um, created a, a virtual drone race. So th th we were able to let hundreds of um, of innovators um, test their AIs in a virtual drone race online. <laughs> Um, and and then create a scoreboard there. So that is another like those approaches of creating contests um, that um, provide selecting is another powerful tool for doing that. Very cool. Yeah, great. So I think we're we're almost out of time. Um, I know we kind of jumped around a little bit, and I hope people have gotten a feel for um, you know for some of the differences. But um, you know, we can we can take a question or two. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I'm going to come back on screen here. We've got um, several interesting questions come through. So panelists, you can see those questions in both the Q&A and the chat. Um, I think that this is an interesting one from Jose. So what formal education do you suggest to improve your innovation skills? Um, there are courses on offer in the marketplace these days, but I'd really like to hear from, you know, both sides in terms of the, the skills necessary or the experience or we you know what route you might suggest people take to get involved as an innovator? Good question. I, I, I'll, I'll give you my answer um, first. Um, so, um, so, and it's, it's going to be a bit of a um, contradictory answer, but um, you know, I think the, so I, I um, don't have a college degree. I dropped out of university to start my first company. And, um, um, and so, um, you know, it just felt it, 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 it was too constraining for me um, to fit into it. Um, and I think some people are like that. That being said, I have a huge um, 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 like desire for education and value education greatly and highly recommend that, you know, people um, have become lifelong learners and uh, you know degrees and, and post-secondary education I think is really great. Um, none of that is going to be useful for innovation. And in fact, um, um, the more you kind of have a conception, the more you spend in the conceptual realm of innovation, like, like learning about innovation in schools, I actually think it can get in the way. I think that innovation's kind of like tap dancing, you know, um, um, classroom lectures on how to do it ain't going to help beyond the basics. You need to tap dance and practice. So practicing innovation is really important. And the hard part about it is um, the failures, because without failure, there is no innovation, right? It's, it, it's just a project, right? Like going to the store to get milk is not an innovative act, right? But, you know, finding milk in the Sahara Desert would be. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the there's failure. And so if you want to get good at innovation, um, practice it, working on stuff where you're going to deal with a lot of failure. That's the secret power. Uh, so so I would add in a similar, very similar vein, I'm, I'm not a big fan of academic coursework around innovation either. Um, and in fact, I can tell you our hiring strategy yet, too. We look for people who uh, have a strong technical background, uh, but then most importantly, kind of right along with that failure idea, uh, we look for people who have passion uh, for these topics, for crossing that chasm, for solving some of these key problems that, that would be great to, to move us ahead in this world. Uh, and so if you show me somebody with a technical background, even an undergrad in engineering or in chemistry or whatever, uh, and they have a passion for solving these types of problems. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll teach you the skills. You have to go out and practice. Uh, we'll give you a lot of that at Yet2 on a daily basis. Um, you know, go work in a large company. Um, and one other place where I do think you can accelerate your education a little bit is at uh, a lot of the innovation conferences uh, and listening to people talking about the war stories and, and putting up their case studies especially those conferences where you're allowed to talk a little bit about the failures uh, because you'll get a lot more learning out of the failures than the successes. 
um, but but agreed, uh, I'd, uh, I would head I would bias heavily toward real real world and some of those personality traits uh, rather than an, an academic coursework. Yeah, excellent. I mean, for me, what comes to mind is sharpen your PowerPoint skills, your presentation skills, your, you know, ability to refine and define concepts, writing skills, you know, some of those basics, really, mm -hmm. um, and interacting and networking. And I mean, we could probably go into another session completely on, you know, what this means for the future of work and education um, altogether. Um, I think that there's another interesting question. It has to do with, I'm taking it more to do with like the challenge design phase. Um, so maybe we could briefly touch on like, uh, the question was what process do you undertake to understand the challenge that's trying to be solved in the tech scouting route? Does the client bring it to you or does yet to do the research to define it? And we could probably answer this from both the hero X and the yet to side. I know we touched on it. So is there any last thought, uh, comments on that? Yeah, and I'll go, I'll go first this time around and then serve into, into Christian. Um, we, we do really prefer that our clients not have gotten very far into trying to define it uh, or propose that solution space that we were talking about earlier. Bring us the problem. Uh, we'll work through it together. Uh, if we don't think our networks and our approach are going to help very much, we'll tell you that because we would far rather pass uh, than fail uh, trying to take on a project. Um, one of our clients that we can talk about just as an example is uh, this, this little beverage company called PepsiCo. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of them, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they do a great job with us these days of uh, identifying new uh, uh, strategic technology roadmap spaces they're interested in moving into. And I, I can't share any of the details uh, publicly because uh, a, a lot of that's very sensitive information. But, but they'll throw topic areas at us uh, and then we'll brainstorm with their teams. Uh, do we think we can define a search? Do we think we can define a problem set uh, that's gonna yield useful and, and valuable results and move them ahead? Uh, and then based on whether we like that answer or not, we then jointly decide whether to move into a project or not. Um, so it, uh, that, that, um, uh, that PepsiCo approach, we, we really like a lot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, I, I think, um, um, I bet you there's a lot of um, parallels in terms of the design phase, like the design and planning phase for both tech scouting and crowdsourcing. I actually uh, uh, see that, um, you know, that that early work could be done before even the decision of whether to um, do tech scouting or crowdsourcing or a hybrid um, is is applied. And um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, the, the shape of it becomes more specific once you've uh, decided, you know, what, which one's the better fit. Yeah, excellent. And I mean, just to add to the earlier comments, like challenge design, the field of challenge design um, as a, you know, career opportunity is, I think, a very a growing sector. Um, so branching from there, this one might be interesting from both sides too. the common demographic of crowdsource uh, respondents. Like, I mean, really this from both sides, we're seeing a global involvement. Um, but can we speak to that a little bit? Yeah, we, we um, so we've, you know, we've had um, participation from hundreds of thousands uh, in on Hero X challenges. And we've got a lot of insights into the demographic side. Uh, interesting thing is, um, so it's far more um, egalitarian than you know, your, your typical demographic for tech or, or other uh, industries. Um, the, uh, the, there's, there tends to be two bumps. Um, uh, the first bump would be you know, people early in their career, um, post-secondary graduates, uh, people um, just after that, um, kind of the, you know, wanting to um, make a mark in their career, um, pursuing their interests. There's another bump, um, you know, closer to the retirement age. I think it has to do with the discretionary time and the accumulated expertise that people build during that time. Um, they, you know, they have the time and the resources, and most importantly, uh, the insights and expertise that they've developed um, to be able to participate in these. So those are the two kind of demographic uh, bumps that we see uh, the most. And but what's really interesting is that. Um, 75% of the um, best solutions are sourced from non-experts in crowdsourcing. 
Um, and, um, and that means that, um, you know, these are like, you know, people who, who aren't like, if, if let's say it's a data science thing, you know, they're not a, a formal data science person. Now this is, this tends to be more on the creative side of uh, the crowdsourcing challenges. The more technical they get, uh, I think the ratio uh, skews in the other direction, but that's a really great um, segue into, into a hybrid approach of using both tech scouting and crowdsourcing. You know, you use the, the tech scouting to give you that targeted precision uh, and the proactivity for a solution, but then use crowdsourcing for the wild card and the X factor. And the two can be done in parallel very successfully. Um, so I would add from the yet two side, probably our plurality of solution provider is a startup company that has gotten to some kind of a pilot commercial scale. Uh, so it might be a team of five or 20. They might have raised some money. They know who their first customer is. They know what they need to do to scale to get to commercial with that first customer. That's probably our, uh, our, our, our most repeated uh, profile of solution provider. Uh, we certainly see individual experts uh, as being uh, key solution providers in certain types of work. Uh, large companies, research institutes, um, small companies that are a couple hundred people, uh, those all fit into the network as well, and those all have solved some, some really important problems for our clients. Um, but uh, more on the company side with the technology moving along uh, than, uh, than a, um, a lone inventor, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's great. Excellent. So um, thank you both. Uh, you certainly start to see the case for the, the hybrid approach to using uh, both methods. This has been an excellent conversation today. We're just nearing the last minute. Any uh, final thoughts from both of our panelists today before we wrap up? Well, I'd say uh, from our perspective, uh, we're very honored uh, to be along with uh, HeroX. Uh, thank you very much for, for sharing the hour with us. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if we answered that, that scouting is better than crowdsourcing or the other way. Uh, but we're very excited about our partnership and looking forward to, uh, to solving problems really with you all. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that the, the question, it, it's, it's a bit of a, of a, of a, of a false question. Um, it, it's kind of like saying, what's better, um, a hammer or a screwdriver, <laughs> right? Um, well, you know, you can't, that can't be answered yeah. unless you have an application for it. But Based I think that, uh, companies, it's important for companies to be committed to innovation um, it's a really, it's a core competency for organizations that want to, you know, be competitive and stick around for a while. And they need to have both of these solutions, uh, these tools in the tool belt. And then they bring it out when the right tool is needed. And, and so I would in, in invite all organizations committed to innovation to uh, proactively, you know, gain um, expertise and understanding and practice in both tech scouting and crowdsourcing so that you can move quickly and you can use these two powerful tools for innovation um, as you evolve and deal with the changing times. Perfect. And with that, uh, I think we've, we've covered it all. Thank you both for your time. Uh, to our participants, you'll be receiving a recording of the webinar and we uh, invite you to um, further explore both companies and reach out to us uh, anytime with your questions and queries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye for now.